calling case C181554, Ramos versus Nielsen. Council, please come to the podium and stay in for the record. Good morning, Your Honor. Ahilan Arulanandam for the plaintiffs. All right. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Jessica Karp Bansel for the plaintiffs. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Rhett Martin for the defendants. All right. Thank you, Ms. Martin. I don't know if you all want to make an appearance. Good morning, Your Honor. Alicia Dagan for plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Emmy Lou McLean for the plaintiffs. All right. Thank you. All right. We are on. Uh, First and foremost, uh, this morning for a hearing on defendant's motion to dismiss, um, and I think the the first issue we have to address, of course, is the jurisdictional stripping provision um, uh, in uh, 2554A. Uh, but before I we get into that, uh, I just want to make sure I understand exactly what the theory of the plaintiffs are. Um, the plaintiffs are challenging not the designation or undesignation of the four countries per se um, uh, uh, as, a, as designated under the uh, for temporary protective status, but the change in the rule or interpretation of that statute. Is that right? That's correct, Your Honor. As to the APA claim, that's correct, Your Honor. And is the change? What is the scope of the alleged change? Is it? not considering any current and intervening circumstances or disasters or those not considering those which have some exacerbating or prolongation of the originating condition and does that make any difference in this case i don't know well uh, i think if you look for example at the nicaragua designation uh, they sp in uh, 2012 you know they specifically say the roads uh, were, you know what, I, I may be mixing them up. Hold on one moment, Your Honor. Yeah. The El Salvador designation, Your Honor, in 2012 when they're extending, and they say the roads have, uh, from the earthquake damage, have been repaired, but there's other problems with the roads. If you look at Haiti, uh, Haiti is designated because of an earthquake in 2010, but then when it's extended, they look to Hurricane Matthew. You know, Hurricane Matthew is not caused by the earthquake in 2010. Um, so I think it's clear that there is no way to... And it was not extended because under the rubric of Hurricane Matthew having exacerbated the conditions of the earthquake? Uh, I mean... Self was a condition that was sufficient to extend TPS? The, the exception that you're describing could, I suppose, swallow the rule. Uh, it's, it's difficult at this point to know uh, whether, you know, uh, how now the government is trying to draw the line to justify the change that's happened. Uh, but if you look at the statements that were made by the government officials, and they said, for example, Secretary Kelly, the program TPS is for a specific event in Haiti, it was the earthquake. Haiti had horrible conditions before the earthquake. Those conditions aren't much better after, but the earthquake was why TPS was granted. That's how I have to look at it. So does that, does that permit consideration of Hurricane Matthew because it has an exacerbating effect on the earthquake? You know, I don't know, but they didn't mention Hurricane Matthew when they terminated TPS for Haiti, and they had mentioned it previously. So you know, whether the government now uh, wants to try and shoehorn what is uh, we allege a change uh, by sort of creating a new conceptual framework and saying you can put the, the uh, you know, intervening conditions that they used to consider into this box. Um, I think that's going to be a factual, I mean, to, 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 that is a factual dispute then, and we're entitled to show that you know, their post hoc explanatory theory can't actually capture all of what, what the actual phenomena here. You know, so what we're alleging is it used to focus, permit consideration of intervening conditions. Now they- Irrespective of whether it was specifically tied to exacerbating original condition, some of them were independent of the original condition. Yes, Your Honor, that it used to permit them regardless of whether or not they were actually exacerbating, uh, and that now the focus is on the originating condition 
and, and you don't look at whether they're um, exacerbating. Uh, but again, as I said, if, if they want to try to shoehorn everything into this uh, you know, new, new account of their change practice, uh, that's a factual dispute. And we're entitled to say that, oh, that Secretary Kelly didn't understand it that way when he terminated Haiti or when he terminated TPS for El Salvador. Does that answer your question, Your Honor? Yeah, it does. We may get into some factual questions. If you get into, like, Darfur, uh, uh, Sudan, for instance, they're, they're, uh, that probably has the most extensive analysis of current conditions that are uh, compared to some other ones. If you look at El Salvador uh, in the 2016 extension, there are a number of things that were referenced, um, such as water access, uh, uh, coffee rust epidemic, uh, various things that uh, were cited and they that were omitted or not addressed in the 2018 termination. I guess that's your point. So um, maybe there's a bit of a mixed record here, and some some uh, statements are a bit more robust than others. But but I just want to make sure I understand the theory of your case. Yes, Your Honor. And and uh, to be clear. This is what we were saying in our mo the brief we just filed uh, yesterday, I guess it was. Uh, it's been a long 24 hours. The, if, if, in fact, uh, we have not um, adequately pled, even for 12B6 purposes, that there is uh, an unexplained departure from the prior practice, then we lose on 12B6 but that for the APA claim. But that has nothing to do with whether there's a subject matter jurisdiction dispute, 12B1 dispute, based on 1254A uh, B5, the, the jurisdiction stripping provision. Because for the purposes of that, you just you presume that there is uh, a unexplained departure or a new rule and ask, would the court have the power to uh, remedy that under the APA if in fact there is an unexplained departure? And so th that whole debate about whether or not there's a new rule, it has nothing to do with the subject matter jurisdiction dispute. It only has to do with whether or not We've stated a claim, and so we're entitled to discovery. If we have stated a claim, if we've gotten that far, then we should get to find out what were the, what were the documents that Secretary Kelly had in front of him when he made the statement in his testimony. Secretary Nielsen made an even clearer one. She said, the law really restricts my ability to extend TPS. The law says that if the effects of the originating event, so that's a causation issue, do not continue to exist, then the Secretary of Homeland Security must terminate. What was she looking at when she said that? Was she looking at a memo that said, oh, well, if it's an exacerbating condition, if the hurricane causes the earthquake recovery effort to get worse, then you can look at it. Or was she looking at a memo that said, originating condition, intervening condition. It's very black and white. And we're entitled to find out if there is such a memo. And if there is, obviously, then that would suggest Well, that to get there, you have to get past the, the very first question. That is, assuming, for instance, that your uh, assertions of a new policy or new interpretation are true, that may be disputed, but assuming that uh, that's been alleged and adequately alleged, does that escape the jurisdictional stripping provision? That's what I want to address now. I think that's the most critical question. And so um, I'm happy to start, but I think it's their motion. Well, they it's your motion, start. and I, I have a couple questions for you, uh, Council. <coughs> Good morning. Um, it is. Fairly clear, is it not, that there is a presumption uh, that um, of, of review? There's a strong presumption that actions of federal agencies are reviewable, um, but upon a showing of clear and convincing evidence of a contrary legislative intent, that can be overcome. So you have that presumption, and then you have the presumption about review, uh, judicial review, where constitutional claims have been asserted, because that raises separation of power questions if you were to. Uh, find that there is no jurisdiction. So starting with that and then combining that with the Supreme Court's decision in the Catholic Social Service case and the McNary case, which seemed to construe the term determination to mean determinations in a sort of case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if it's an individual, it's an individual adjustment situation. If it's a country-by-country -country under TPS, you look at each determination but not to general challenges to sort of procedures or more systemic uh, uh, policies or changes, which is what the plaintiffs are alleging here. So why, why would, the, in view of the presumption, in view of the Supreme Court precedent, 
which have narrowly construed the word determination to mean um, sort of individual determinations and not systemic uh, sort of uh, issues. Why would that uh, preclude judicial review here? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons, Your Honor. First, the, the 1254A says any determination. And it would be impossible to separate out the ultimate decision to terminate itself from the various balancing of the factors that the Secretaries of Homeland Security have to take into account. That it sweeps in everything that you know, plaintiffs are trying to challenge here, whether the new rule or the ultimate termination itself. And I think the distinction between the case here and McNary and Catholic Services can be seen in terms of the relief. You know, the relief that was awarded in McNary was not um, an award of special agricultural worker status. It was the right to have a redo of an application for that SAW status in light of new procedures if they prevailed on their claim that the procedures were in violation of due process. Here, plaintiffs are seeking a rescission of the terminations themselves. And that, there is no way to reach that without reviewing the determination. Well, but the ultimate, if you're looking at the ultimate relief, uh, the rescission of, if what they're seeking is a rescission of these determinations, that would not preclude a redetermination uh, of further, that's procedurally correct, for instance. If this were in the McNary sort of world, that would be true, Your Honor. But, it, but the, our position is that we're not because, first of all, the, the, the new role doesn't exist, which can be term determined on the face of the Federal Register notices alone. And secondly, even if it did, the, what they're calling a new rule is part and parcel of the determination itself. There is no way to segregate out the decision to terminate. But wasn't that true in, 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 in Catholic uh, Social Services and McNary? I mean, they were challenging the interp INS's interpretation uh, of certain criteria which determined whether adjustment of status was, was available or not. I mean, so it informed the determination in, in the case. And in fact, they said that ultimately, uh, in a deportation context, perhaps, you know, uh, these issues could be raised. So it does, it is tied up in both situations. The determination of the systemic problem has an impact on the individual case. I don't know how you can separate that in either one of those. I, well, in Catholic services, for instance, it was a rulemaking. You know, it was a, a formal rule that was being challenged, or regulation that was being challenged. And in McNary, it was the formalized procedures about how you would apply for this status. There's nothing like that here. What we're challenging here is the Secretary's discretionary weighing of the statutory factors that lies, that has been entrusted to the Secretary by Congress and lies uniquely within the executive's competency over foreign policy. That there is no way to, to extrapolate from that a rule that says, uh, you know, this particular factor must be weighed this much and this factor must be weighed another, or how the secretary has come to that decision. This is the determination encompasses, as it says in the statute, any determination encompasses every aspect of the decision making process. And so for so you would emphasize uh, the word any? Is that, is that why it's broader than just determination? I'm not sure what other word could be used when describing if you intended to, to focus on the determination country by country, the designation. I don't know what other word you would use besides any. Uh, I, well, that is emphasizing that it's it all encompassing in terms of the factors that the secretaries are considering. And it's also worth noting that the legislative history says none of the decisions with respect to TPS should be subject judicial, to judicial review. But it's not specific in terms of, uh, again, it, it, it sort of echoes the language of the statute. I'm not sure it sheds much light on, for instance, uh, challenges to constitutional uh, or systemic type issues. Well, it, it, our position would be that none and any are both sort of unqualified terms that sweep within them every aspect of the decision-making process. What about the fact that in McNary, the Supreme Court, <clears throat> um, as part of its analysis, talks about uh, if judicial review were limited, uh, that is a challenge to, that's of this nature here, whether it's a constitutional challenge or to the interpretation stat uh, challenge, <clears throat> were to be reviewed, it would be only in the context of, for instance, a deportation, if we got to the removal 
proceeding and there'd be judicial review, but that would be limited to the administrative record and subject to uh, narrow abuse of discretion review, which the court said would not be consistent normally with a constitutional challenge, which then suggests that Congress did not intend to cabin everything um, with the with the jurisdictional stripping statute and to allow room for uh, a broader constitutional challenge. Well, the, uh, whether it's framed as an APA challenge or a constitutional challenge, Your Honor, that at the end of the day, the challenge would require the judiciary to make its own ind independent assessment of the factors and the, the sufficiency of the explanation given of those factors in the Federal Register notices. And it is that that the, the jurisdiction prohibition addresses. Well, uh, I'm not sure I understand that. So you're saying if there's a constitutional challenge, that would be done within the framework of the APA. Um, and, and therefore, even if that were allowed, you would still be limited to the record, that the APA scope review would be no broader than uh, the scope of review on a removal order? Uh, our position, yes, that the, the, the if, if we're talking about the discovery issues for a moment, that uh, the re review here must at least start with the administrative record. Of course, there are exceptions under the APA. I guess we'll talk about that later in terms of when you can go beyond the record. Um, but still, the, the court, notwithstanding all that, uh, in McNary case, is, in addition to the fact that the term a determination describes a single act rather than a group of decisions or a practice or procedure employed in making decisions, noted the, the sort of the implications. If you didn't allow for judicial review of constitutional claims or a, an interpretation claim that's systemic, the, the, the normal route of judicial review would be so constricted in the context of an adjustment of status or a removal proceeding that uh, that would be inconsistent with the normal way you adjudicate constitutional or broader claims. And that seems to apply here as well. Well, the, again, to, to, to not to be repetitive, but the, the existence or not of this collateral practice or policy can be determined on the face of the Federal Register notices. And it is our position that the terminations here are consistent and reflect and mirror the terminations and extensions and designations given for TPS and by every prior administration. And that, that on that fact, the, the, the new rule theory does, is, is a predicate for subject matter jurisdiction here. And plaintiffs have not sufficiently shown that such a new rule or practice exists. Well, all right, that, that gets in part to the merits questions, which we'll get to in a moment, but I'm trying to get to the interpretation question and whether McNary and Catholic Social Services is really uh, um, controlling or persuasive to, to the instant situation. The court in McNary also notes that if Congress really intended to limit review um, uh, to bar broader statutory constitutional challenges, they could have done so and give an example of the kind of language that Congress could have used. And again, is, does that argument apply here? It, well, Your Honor, there, there's you know, different Congresses have chosen different languages over time for judicial uh, jurisdiction stripping provisions, such as the one here. Uh, the, the language here is, is unqualified. The legislati legislative history uh, confirms that the language is unqualified. And uh, uh, again, it's, it, it, it was, it's hard to under, to, for us to see how the, the, what plaintiffs are calling the policy or practice could be separated from each individual determination. Well, the court gives an example. Uh, it said that the Congress could have used, as, as happens in the veterans' benefits uh, context, uh, barring review as to on all questions, quote, on all questions of law and fact, as opposed to determination uh, with respect to designation, termination, extension, uh, TPS status. So I mean, that, I mean, that's just one of several factors, but I mean, it seems like that argument or that concern would apply here as well. Congress could have certainly chosen different language. Uh, but the, the language, again, here is, is unqualified and broad. And the, you know, whether it's uh, 
any question of law or fact or any determination or I think the legislative history says you know none of the decisions um, those are all unqualified and I think broader than the the uh, provisions and examples given in McNary. All right. Well, let me uh, let me hear from the other side on that point. That one, the breadth of the language, the fact that it, it, it would seem to literally apply on its face. Uh, any it says any determination, and and your theory would affect that determination. It maybe maybe the the challenges to an underlying broader systemic issue, but it does affect any determination. And and how do you uh, respond to uh, Council's uh, comment about? Uh, the two Supreme Court cases, if you look at the relief sought, um, it is different in kind than the relief sought here. Your Honor, so first with respect to any, the statute in DeMore v. Kim said no court may set aside any action or decision by the Attorney General, uh, but it wasn't good enough to preclude review of a challenge to that legislation uh, on, that happened to be on constitutional grounds, but I think uh, the rationale that the court used was to cite Johnson uh, v. Robeson and Webster v. Doe. Um, if you look at the statute in Johnson v. Robinson, it said the decisions of the administrator on any question of law or fact under any law of the Veterans Administration. That wasn't good enough to preclude review of a constitutional claim. Uh, and then Bowen, which is four years before the TPS statute is enacted. So it's clearly they're legislating against that, back that backdrop. Um, Bowen is no findings of fact or decision of the secretary shall be reviewed by any tribunal except as herein provided. So, you know, that's not any, but it's no decision. Uh, so this is, these cases are not about whether the, they use any or a or no or, they're about the baseline presumption uh, of administrative review of agency action, as Your Honor had, um, had stated. Uh, and some of these statutes are, quite a lot clearer than uh, the statute that we have here, unless you say that you intend to preclude constitutional claims, and unless you s specify the scope beyond just determination and say we're talking about something much broader, uh, the courts do not read those to preclude review of, of, um, of uh, claims that do not go the, to the particular determination or decision or whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Um, and what's, what's an example of language that has been construed <coughs> Uh, to bar, uh, is there an example of that, to bar even systemic or constitutional challenges? There's not an example of one that's been read to bar constitutional challenges because uh, the courts have been very careful to avoid the massive constitutional problem and sort of a conundrum of federal courts of whether or not they could entirely strip judicial review of constitutional claims. This, this statute is not close to clear enough to ask this court to wade into that extremely difficult question. Uh, Statutory claims, certainly, uh, Section 1252B9 uh, says uh, no uh, question of law or fact, uh, and I can't remember the exact wording of it. We cited it in our brief, but it's question of law or fact, and you heard that in some of these other ones, any question of law or fact. Yeah. That, I think, would preclude legal claims, although they have other scope limitations, like under this subsection. You know, so the language Your Honor just was referring to with my friend, in Johnson v. Robeson, the Veterans Administration um, case, says any question of law or fact under any law administered by the Veterans Administration. And so then we've got that anal um, you know, analogy here, because we've got uh, any determination of the Attorney General with respect to the designation, termination, or extension under this subsection. And so then, you know, there's, a, there's a separate question, well, what does under this subsection mean? And uh, under their view, I don't think it means anything, actually. Uh, I don't understand what their theory is for how that phrase limits this provision. But to us, it, it limits it by specifying that the challenge has to arise from this subsection, that is subsection B, which is the subsection which gives the secretary the authority to uh, extend or terminate a TPS decisions. And what the, what the statute says is the secretary uh, has to determine, they use the word determine, that the country no longer continues to meet the conditions for designation. And so that's what the statute bars review of. If you say, oh, we disagree about whether uh, the coffee rust, uh, leaf rust epidemic actually has abated sufficiently to permit the return of people to El Salvador, 
you know, that's the determination that the statute is directing you to in subsection B, because that's what it says under this subsection. If that's your challenge, then there's a jurisdictional uh, problem, that you're challenging whether the country no longer continues to meet the conditions for designation. We obviously do not uh, challenge that. We are challenges to the criteria that go into making that determination. And th the rule that says that the government has to explain and justify a massive revision to the criteria, that arises from the APA. It's the APA that requires the government to explain when it uh, engages in a substantial But in a literal departure. sense, changing the criteria, as you allege, to res that results in a termination is a challenging that is, in a sense, a challenge to the termination. It's the basis of the termination. If they had made a factual basis using the same criteria, let's say they took all the conditions and, and considered intervening hurricanes and volcanoes and droughts and said, we've looked at it, determined that uh, they're not as severe anymore, even though that was only six months ago or 12 months ago, um, that would, I would think you would concede to be a termination, uh, a determination that's probably not reviewable. Yes, if it's done on the facts, the yes, factual assessment. I, I'm uh, a little nervous about conceding to any hypothetical <laughs> without getting it precisely, but if it's a challenge to whether or not the country no longer continues to meet the conditions for designation, if that's the challenge, then it's barred by the statute. Um, and, Your Honor, uh, this sort of pertains also to your relief question, the, the second yes. question you what had. about that? So uh, whether or not somebody, this is CSS, whether or not somebody has engaged in a brief, innocent, or casual departure from the United States so that it interrupts their presence and bars them from legalizing, that's the issue in CSS. Yep. Okay. Obviously, if, if you say, oh, they've wrongly interpreted the phrase brief, innocent, or casual departure, the effect of that is you undo the denial of the legalization uh, application. And it's a legal question. And uh, CSS, the effect of the decision is to uh, revoke, I think, thousands of uh, denials of legalization of status. And if you look at the Ninth Circuit cases that we cite, uh, Immigrant Assistance Project, Proyecto San Pablo, they're extending the application period. That's the relief they're granting. And they're letting people who were denied a legalization just do it again. So the, and this is standard agency law practice, right? The court sets aside the administrative agency's decision, and you vacate the decision, and that's the relief that you're granted, and that's the relief we seek here. Vacate, uh, set aside the TPS terminations. That doesn't mean that they're barred by the stripping statutes. It always depends on the reason why you are saying the action was illegal. And if the reason why the action was illegal is because it was unconstitutional, or because there was a problem with the legal interpretation of the underlying rule, then the courts permit it. And the same is true of McNary. You can see it says in the decision they reopening uh, the cases of people who were denied legalization under the Special Agricultural Worker Program. So the, the, the scope of relief is analogous. It doesn't make the ultimate determination of removability or not, but... It just means that, yes, exactly, Your Honor, uh, you set aside the decision, if they came back and explained their departure in a reasoned way, uh, th I mean, that, that, that would be open to the agency to try to come up with a reasoned uh, decision that would justify uh, terminating TPS, or I think to, uh, perhaps to adopt a good faith approach, I would say they should then reconsider the decision under appropriate legal criteria, and they can make a new decision. Your Honor isn't saying under the APA claim, that they can't uh, make a new decision after you set it aside. You know, there was a little discu uh, discussion discovery. I could save it for later, or I could talk about it now. Uh, well, uh, why don't we get through the, the various claims, because discovery may also hinge on the availability of the, or the viability of the other substantive claims. So why don't we... Uh, uh, I'll postpone this question about whether uh, the administrative record is sufficient. Right, right. Your Honor, I have further questions. No, I, I want to talk about the due process, and that's why you're up here, um, to understand the limits and the theory of your due process claim, first on behalf of the, the um, citizen children. Um, Your Honor, if I may excuse me, uh, I should have said this at the outset, but my co-counsel, Ms. Uh, Bansel, okay. will be doing the equal protection and APA and TPS holder claims. Uh, I'm doing the children's claim as far as right. That's permissible with the court. All right, that, that's fine. Um, what, what's the limit of your theory? I mean, if the idea that any, anything that causes 
and it's not a that causes separation of parent from the child um, implicates and I, I believe you're talking about substantive due process not procedural due process implicates a liberty claim that's protected by due process uh, the government says, well, that would undermine, you know, any kind of, in any context where a parent is removed because they don't have legal status here or when a parent is incarcerated or, um, you know, any such situation. Um, what, what's the limit of your theory and what is the scope of review? If one were to find a liberty interest here, what is the standard of, of, of scrutiny? Uh, let me just answer that last question first. The scope of review is the review available in Moore uh, v. City of East Cleveland, Pierce v. Society of Sisters, which is to say the government has to have a significant uh, interest in forcing the child to choose between. The significant family. interest, is that more than uh, any conceivable interest under typical rational basis review? Sometimes been called rational basis with uh, teeth, as Your Honor noted at the last hearing. Uh, and. You certainly can win a claim under that, as those Supreme Court cases establish, uh, but it's not strict scrutiny. It's not a fundamental right uh, to be uh, denied that forced choice, which is the claim that's rejected, for example, in the Ninth Circuit cases the government relies on. Um, to, to go more broadly to this question about what the limiting principle is, uh, the, the, there is clearly a, an interest that every citizen child has in living uh, with their parents and in this country. So there's no question in our view that every child has that interest. That's true regardless of their age and regardless of the reason why the deportation is happening. But it doesn't follow that uh, the immigration law will be destroyed or that there's no way to have uh, uh, a deportations of people who have citizen children because this is just a rational basis test, right? So the government has a, uh, an interest that comes to bear when you uh, do the, the balancing. And it doesn't even have to be something that would happen on a case-by-case -case basis because you can look at categorically at the government's interests, like in the Adam Walsh uh, Act in Gebhardt. You know, this is our people who uh, have been convicted of sex offenses. And so the government has an obvious manifest interest in protecting the children in that case. You know, he, here, the, the protection of the children interest runs the other way, right? These are citizen children of this country who are now potentially going to be sent to places that are dangerous, that our country was very recently describing as too unsafe for the return of any of their nationals. So that's, that's just a factor that goes into the balance. Uh, similarly- But if you say that the, that the government can assert a categorical interest to satisfy the more tests, um, doesn't the, the government have a categorical, in, categorical interest in enforcing uh, the TPS scheme, that this is a temporary protective status as meant um, for, you know, uh, as the purposes set forth in the statute to provide temporary protection for those from, uh, you know, uh, calamitous type uh, situations and conditions back in their native you know, country, but it's not meant to be a permanent. So why doesn't the government have at least a rational or significant interest in enforcing uh, its TPS scheme that, it's, that it has been enacted. I think this goes to another way in which our claim is different from all of the claims that uh, are addressed in prior cases, which is the relief we're seeking here is also only temporary. And we're only asking that people be allowed to live with their parents and in their country uh, until they reach the age of adulthood. So would that mean that even if the secretary had properly made a procedurally proper determination of terminating TPS status, let's say, for Sudan, that your claim is that the child would still have a constitutional due process interest not to have his or her parent go back to Sudan, even under a properly applied, within a statute, a TPS determination? Yes, Your Honor. And, and uh, if we uh, get past the motion to dismiss, we would expect the court to address this issue on the merits uh, only if the court first found that the TPS holders had no claim. So it's only if we lose the APA claim, lose the equal protection, lose due process for the TPS holders that the court would then address this issue. And yes, uh, our, uh, it is a, a right, even if, even if uh, Sudan now no longer meets the conditions for designation, uh, you still have a problem. I mean, you have, uh, uh, you know, H. Nida uh, Senema wants to play flag football next year. You know, they don't play flag football in Haiti. She's 
a, a teenager. She's grown up here her whole life. Even if the uh, secretary dots all the I's and crosses all the T's in terminating TPS, you still have now children having, uh, having to make this very, very difficult forced choice. And so the question the due process clause asks is, does the government have a significant interest in forcing them to make that choice now rather than allowing them to wait until they become adults when, uh, you know, obviously children leave their, uh, you know, parents and go off into the world uh, uh, once, once they become adults. And, uh, and that would apply regardless of the legal status. Putting aside TPS, wouldn't your argument apply regardless of the legal immigration status of the parent? No, Your Honor. Uh, again, it, it turns on uh, the government's interests in each particular context. So, for example, uh, a person who has been here unlawfully in, and the government then has a stronger interest in enforcing the immigration law than it does for people who have lived here lawfully. But that would overcome the, the, <laughs> the due process rights of the citizen child who was born here, for instance, and would be forced with the same sort of Hobson's choice that you that you posit of having to uh, having to go back with their undocumented parent to, to their home, native, to the parent's native country, or live without that parent. That same Hobson's choice would obtain. But you're saying in that instance, there's a significant government interest if the person is not here legally. Well, it's a different question, Your Honor. Uh, that is, I mean, I'm not saying that that person always loses, or you know, maybe they lose, maybe they win. But it's a different question because the government's interest is manifestly stronger. And this just goes to one other point I want to make on this, Your Honor. There's no question that you know, this claim that we're raising, there's no case before that has addressed the same claim. It's novel. But that's not surprising because what we have here is a situation where the government is, as far as we can tell, this has not happened in our country's history. You've got a set of 200, actually 400,000 people, all TPS holders, but you know, more than 200,000 from these countries who have lived here lawfully for at least eight years and in many cases for decades. So they've lived here lawfully for 20 years and now there's not any allegation that they individually did anything wrong. After That's not the criteria. That's not what TPS is set up for. It's not about wrong or right behavior. It's about conditions, temporary conditions, uh, in the native country. Yeah, absolutely, Your Honor. This is an argument that uh, even if the statute were properly followed, where you've allowed people to live here lawfully for uh, 20 years, uh, that you cannot then I mean, people, often people have children when they have lived in a place for 20 years, right? So then you, it gives rise to different kinds of rights than what we have seen in other cases. And if the government had repeatedly, for example, say, canceled the green cards of people who were married on the ground that we don't want to favor those anymore, or said children who are adopted no longer can adjust their status, and so we're getting rid of that. Then we would have seen cases like this and this issue would have been addressed. Those are actually, I think, closer analogies to what we have here. People lawfully living here for a long period of time. Yes, under a temporary program, it's true, but they're lawfully living here. And then, through no fault of their own, the government seeks to take away uh, their status, which puts their children then into this impossible choice. And that's the reason why I think it's, just, it's different from a situation Your Honor describes where, well, if a person's unlawfully lived here for a long time, well, the government hasn't blessed their presence, and so its, its interest in enforcing the immigration law is greater in that instance. You know, a person who... Well, why is it greater than, than allowing somebody to come conditionally, subject to certain conditions, and then determining those conditions no longer apply? Uh, why doesn't the government have that same interest in enforcing that law as it would enforcing a law that uh, restricts entry in the first place? Um, again, Your Honor, I think it, it really turns a lot on the fact that this is temporary. The relief that we're talking about that would be granted here in order to vindicate this constitutional right is also still temporary. So it doesn't change the, it doesn't change the uh, temporary nature of the program. It just provides that people who have uh, children, those school-aged children, uh, will, they'll still be forced to into a brutal choice, but they'll be forced into it once they're adults rather than while they're still children. And, and I, I, I think that uh, certainly renders it different uh, from all of the cases that uh, both sides uh, have cited before where what people are seeking is the right to live here permanently. So if you look at the suspension of deportation cases or in Gebhardt it's adjustment of status and Morales it's to adjust through marriage. These people, all of these people are trying to win the right to permanently reside in the United States and usually, Gebhardt is an unusual exception, usually the plaintiff is the non-citizen. You know, and here, 
I think if you look at it from the child's perspective, because the, the, our, our plaintiff, the lead plaintiff in this case, is Krista Ramos. You know, she's a she's a teenager. She's here in the courtroom today, actually, um, as are some of the other um, children uh, and also their parents in this case. Uh, you know, she is a teenager who has grown up in this country. From her perspective, um, there is no um, there is no uh, government interest in, in her being forced to be sent to a country that is. It's, it's the highest murder rate in the world outside of a war zone, uh, El Salvador is. Um, and, and but the action being challenged, that's a consequence of, the, uh, of enforcement. I mean, the action is not directly on her. She's not being ordered to be deported. So the, the question is, does the government have an interest in removing those who no longer enjoy TPS status or any other legal status? And I guess the way you would phrase it is removing them now as opposed to waiting until uh, their child reaches majority age. That's correct, Your Honor. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I would assume I'll, I'll give counsel a chance to respond, but I assume the response is, you know, there is an immigration law that sets forth certain requirements and priorities in terms of uh, who can be admitted, under what circumstances, and for long, and the government has at least a, a general categorical interest in being able to enforce those laws so long as the laws themselves don't contravene the Constitution. For instance, if there, uh, you know, if there's another constitutional problem, you can protect the problem, it's different. But if it's a lawfully enacted statute, doesn't the government uh, have, and this is not a compelling interest test, this is, as you say, a rational basis with a bite, uh, not sure exactly what that means, but a, a very uh, significantly lower standard of review Constitutionally, Your Honor, I, I think, um, if I may, when you say, well, it has to be duly enacted, there may be other constitutional constraints. I think that is the central issue for us as to whether or not we're going to survive the motion to dismiss on this claim. If the government, for example, could discriminate on the basis of race and say, we want to get rid of all the people who, uh, you know, are, uh, I, I won't use the um, ugly words, but, you know, made some racist statement. And then if Congress wrote a law that, that enacted that, the Equal Protection Clause would constrain the government's power to deport people on that basis. The First Amendment does. There's actually cases that hold that, Bridges v. Wixon and Bridges v. California. Right. So that's but where there are particular problems, constitutional problems, with the statute or the ordinance or, or the executive or whatever it is that's being challenged. The, I, I'm asking as a standalone, this due process argument, which assumes there's no other problems in order to be able to assert this claim. Uh, now, if it's dependent on an APA problem, on an uh, equal protection problem, okay, then I can understand that. But if it's if it's a standalone, and you're saying even if there's no constitutional, other constitutional problem with the statute, even if it complies with the APA, even if it's administered consistent with the statute, um, that that any termination of TPS status would have to give way to uh, to the, the minors' rights to have their parent with them. Yeah, and just let, let, the the point of um, uh, the point I was trying to make, perhaps not articulately enough earlier, was you could have a duly enacted statute that had an equal protection problem, or you could have one that was a problem just as applied, like in the First Amendment context, to this particular labor organizer or whatever it is. Right here, the substantive due process component of the due process clause is another substantive constraint on the government's power to write immigration laws, even if they are otherwise duly enacted. They don't come up a lot because the government doesn't do this kind of thing very much. But if the government now wants to force a set of children into this horrific choice, there is a substantive due process body of doctrine. There's plenty of cases that say the family integrity right is fundamental. The right to stay in the country is, is absolute. There's you, there are cases we cited them where Again, you why, can't Why wouldn't that choices. apply to every deportation of a parent? Right. So, so it doesn't apply to every deportation because it only seeks temporary uh, protection. It doesn't, it, we're talking about sending people to countries that, are, that have been found to be uh, uh, dangerous and it's limited to people who were lawfully present for a long period of time. If you're here for less than five years, this doesn't even kick but in. But if somebody were here lawfully but lost that right because uh, you know, of conduct, for instance, lost, lost their permanent residency right or lost uh, whatever, you know, temporary status right. They're here for a period. Even if they're here on a student visa or work visa, and then that ends, but they had a child during his, they're here lawfully. But at that point, that lawful period ends. The visa may be limited to five years or something, 
Are you saying if they've had a child, they can't be removed? If, the, if they then lose that protection, they've been here lawfully. Right, so, so, so the lawful, I mean, there's two different hypotheticals there. The lawful permanent resident, uh, the, the statute, the way it's written, you don't lose your status unless you've done something wrong. You know, almost, unless you abandon your status as a tiny little, uh, you know, but, but for the most part, lawful permanent residents only get deported because they are convicted of crimes. And that is really telling because uh, if Congress suddenly said, no, we're going to strip lawful permanent resident status for all of these people, um, I think they would have, for, for no, not because of any wrongdoing, because we're worried about the effect of it on the labor market. And we don't care that they have children in high school who are here then the children might have a constitutional challenge to that. Uh, and I think that's actually quite analogous to what we have here. Well, that's lawful permanent. So what if somebody's here lawfully on a temporary status, like some kind of visa? I think uh, the, the student visa, and this, this is why we have very deliberately limited this claim to school-aged children. That's both a top barrier, that is, once you become an adult, the right no longer, um, the interest, we're not asserting that that interest justifies this, and also the young, young age. And if you're younger than five, uh, we're also asserting that there, um, you're not part of our class. And the reason for that, there's two reasons for that. You know, one reason is because I think it is much harder for a school-aged child to move. I mean, most people wouldn't even move their school-aged children from you know, in high school from, I don't know, from LA to San Francisco or something, you know, let alone to, to Haiti or Sudan. Uh, so there's this additional trauma on the child. You know, but the other reason for it, Your Honor, is because the government then has an interest in avoiding, I don't even like to use these words, but like the anchor baby problem. I mean, that's what these cases are talking about, is like people, you know, sort of the government's interest, you'll, un you'll undermine the immigration law if people have children. But here, the government can run a temporary program and it can run student visas, and it can have all worker visas, all these things, for periods before the citizen children become a school age. And once they become a school age, it's a more complicated question. You know, so you know, your, your hypothetical, you know, the, the narrow one where I think there might be a similar claim, you know, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of other interests involved, but a, a person who came here on a student visa and stayed here more than uh, five or eight years, eight is the, the shortest time we have in this case, uh, you know, then uh, you know, perhaps uh, you know, they would have a, um, you know, a, a similar argument. Uh, and that's really like the only hypothetical which I think actually could be you know, potentially similar to the one that we have here. You know, that, that hasn't really arisen in the, in the case as much. That suggests that every time, I mean, when the government issues some kind of temporary status for somebody, that, that the interest in enforcing the deadlines and the temporary nature of that is not significant, not rational, not whatever the standard is, enough to override, if they have a child, the child's due process rights to have their to stay here and have their parents stay with them. Well, I'd say two things about that. You know, first, the, the government has five years. They can extend TPS once, twice. I mean, if these are 18-month extensions, you know, even three times. When it goes beyond that, when you're telling people, you can live here for more than five years, that implicates different interests for their children. You know, their children then are growing up, that's a, that's a five-year-old who's grown up it in It almost becomes like an estoppel effect so, on the government. If the government goes beyond five years, the government risks not being able to control and, and terminate TPS status, at least for those who have children? Um, un until they reach the age of majority, Your Honor. And, and the alternative, Your Honor, the alternative view, the government's view, uh, and what you'd have to accept, I think, to accept the opposite is that there is no family integrity right here. Right? That the immigration law always categorically trumps the family integrity right no matter what. Now, Bustamante. Well, in between, you say there's a family integrity right that's acknowledged that may be sufficient to implicate due process, but the interest in exercising a validly enacted law that's not tainted in another, some other constitutional way um, uh, survives rational basis review. Right, and I, and I guess I don't know why substantive due process in that sense would be um, subordinated uh, in a way and rendered it weaker somehow than uh, equal protection, the First Amendment, other, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any doctrinal basis for um, that kind of uh, you know, lower treatment. And I also- Well, yes, there is, because you, you are asserting under the Equal Protection Clause, not just rational basis, but strict scrutiny, because this is a, based on racial or ethnic animus Right. That's a different level of review, and if that 
if that is a cognizable claim, if that claim can be heard with, you know, this court has jurisdiction over it and you're able to prove that, that's a whole different right. animal. If you were just using regular rational basis review, courts have rejected all sorts of classifications in the immigration context in that sense. Yes, yes. My, my point only, Your Honor, is that, uh, is that under the government's view, there is actually no substantive due process right that's enforceable here at all because it's immigration law. And so, you know, some of these hypotheticals, I'd be curious to hear what they think about those. If, if could the government just get rid of all the, um, say, adoptions uh, on the basis of uh, 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 people who've gotten green cards through adoptions? They just pass a law tomorrow that says, okay, uh, those are gone. Or all the marriages that are based on green cards, those are gone. Uh, and say the, the government has an interest here. It's duly enacted. You can, you can have in your deportation hearing, you can challenge whether or not you got your green card through adoption or your green card through marriage. Uh, so you have all the process in the world, but there's no substantive problem there. You know, and our, uh, our, our view is there is a substantive uh, right that's implicated in these cases. And Bustamante uh, and Cardenas and uh, Din Vicari, you know, the, the cases that are about people who are marrying people abroad, right? They're U.S. citizens. They're seeking to marry non-citizens who are abroad. Bustamante is very clear that this implicates the substantive, that's the word they use, the substantive right uh, to uh, uh, no government inter interference in matters of uh, marriage and family or you know, something like that, uh, and citing the, the cases that we have been talking about. So the Ninth Circuit has recognized that there is obviously some substantive right here that has to be balanced. And so then the question is whether these very particular factors, where the people have lived here lawfully, where they're going, the children are going to be sent to countries that are unsafe, where it's a temporary protection, whether those are enough to alter the balancing calculus here uh, compared to you know, these many other situations where the interests are different. Right, let me hear from the government. Uh, the government does argue in its brief that there's no, not even a cognizable interest that, if it were to be recognized, is overridden fairly easily. I think the government is arguing there's no due process right at all to be recognized. Is that the position? Uh, yes. I mean, that is the, the first point, Your Honor, that there is no right. But uh, it, even if we were in a world where there were some process of, of the type in Bustamati or, or Cardenas, it's important that the standard there was that the government only had to give a, a facially legitimate bona fide reason, and that was the end of the matter. Um, so this, you know, the idea that those cases would somehow support the, you know, the, the, the types of scrutiny of the Secretaries of Homeland Security's decisions here, I think, is, um, would, would be unwarranted. Well, maybe it's an academic, I mean, in view of that position, it may be academic, uh, whether you recognize uh, any due process right to start with. Uh, do you have any response to the hypothetical about green cards being revoked when they're based on marriage or adoption, whether any constitutional right would vest in that situation? Uh, the, the government's position is that no constitutional right would vest in that position, Your Honor. But even if it did, it, you'd have, well, if it did, then you'd have to look at whether there's, I guess as you put it, a facially uh, legitimate valid reason. Bonafide reason. Bonafide reason. Right. What about the argument that this is, uh, this is not asking for, for full permanent status, but really a temporary, temporary status, really, a status um, that would be extended tied to the age of the child, and therefore it's not as sort of uh, broad or intrusive as uh, affording, for instance, uh, permanent residence to somebody by marriage or something like that? Well, I think two things, Your Honor. First, that's inviting this court to you know, create a, a basically a new immigration status out of whole cloth, I, and which goes to the second point, which is that these types of fixes are appropriate for Congress. That the the, you know, the concerns that were noted by plaintiffs' counsel are, are, are you know legitimate concerns. It, but we have a branch of government that is entrusted with remedying that situation, and that this is a legislative fix. It's not appropriate for um, you know, the judicial construction of a new type of immigration statute. All right, let's, let's move on to the equal protection uh, question. And um, which I'd like to hear from plaintiff's counsel to make sure I understand the scope of that claim. Um, are you challenging 
the actual termination, the determination to terminate the status, TPS status of these four countries, uh, both as uh, sort of directly as well as challenging the change in rule as violatively or just the change in rule being motivated by improper purposes? We're challenging both, Your Honor. The change in rule is one of the elements under Arlington Heights. You look to procedural departures, and so the change in rule supports the claim of intentional discrimination, but we are not only challenging the change in rule. But also the substantive determination uh, to terminate. And, and not because the conditions in the country are not such as the Secretary found them, but because the decision was motivated by intentional race-based discrimination. Well, um, the Supreme Court may shed some light. Uh, within we were next, checking our email this morning, Your Honor. I take it no decisions come down. So um, in, in some ways it's hard to adjudicate this since par a large part of uh, perhaps not all of your claim, your theory of, of, uh, of equal protection is based on comments made by the President. Um, and I don't know how much useful it'll be to explore the issue, since I think the Supreme Court may be looking at that. But it does raise the question of if you, number one, can you consider those comments uh, made? Uh, are, are we limited to um, time frame? Uh, does that extend to comments that were made not proximate in time, but uh, distance away? Uh, can you consider President's uh, comments made while he was a candidate and not a president, uh, and what's the end? What, what, is there a point where um, anything, any action taken in this arena by the president can be deemed not tainted? Is there some purge period? Um, I, I assume the court is going to uh, may make some comment on that, but in case it doesn't, I'd, I would like to hear your response to the, the limits problem. Under current law, obviously, Your Honor, that, that's, not, that's the only way we can answer the question, but the, the court can consider that range of statements. The, the government has an argument here that the statements are not relevant because the ultimate decision maker was, was the secretary. That argument clearly fails under the, the cat's paw theory of discrimination, which is what the court in the Eastern District of New York found in the Bataya Vidal case. Yes, I'm not, I'm not so concerned with who's making a statement. I, I'm more concerned with how far back can you go? What? How much of a uh, causal relationship needs to be uh, demonstrated as a foundation to consider these, and what's the limit? I understand, Your Honor. As to the limit, under the Arlington Heights test, it's a very sensitive inquiry, I think is the word the court uses. You look at the totality of the circumstances. There is no one factor that is controlling. We would assume in good faith, Your Honor, that if this court were to find that the TPS terminations at issue here were infected by discriminatory animus, that the government would go back and make a good faith effort to redetermine the TPS designations in a constitutional manner. Um, and there is nothing under existing law that would prevent them from doing that even after a finding by this court about intentional discrimination. You could look to, for example, the, the zoning context. There have been, of course, many cases finding that a city made a discriminatory decision um, to deny a zoning application, and I'm not aware of anyone ever suggesting that the city could no longer deny any zoning applications in the future because that one instance was infected by discrimination. Each decision has to be looked at on its own terms. So if the subsequent decision is examined under the criteria of Arlington Heights, notwithstanding an earlier statement made by decision maker, it could still it could withstand equal protection scrutiny. That's correct, Your Honor. So, would the would the proximity? Uh, what what role does proximity and time have uh, to this analysis? I think proximity is relevant under Arlington Heights. The Ninth Circuit has been clear that this is. It's really a question for a trier of fact, and any indication of discriminatory intent can lead to an issue that can only be resolved by the trier of fact, so proximity goes to that. Our allegations have a tight proximal connection in that there was a meeting about TPS um, predated by a week, some of these TPS terminations, at which the President made statements directly about the TPS holders. 
And as I recall, it was, it was in reference in, in more particularly uh, to Haiti, TPS holders from Haiti and El Salvador? Those were the uh, terminations that immediately followed the meeting, Your Honor, but the President's statement, and I, 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 I don't want to say it to the court, but I do think his words are important. He said, why are we having all these people from shithole countries come here? And a reasonable trier of fact could infer he was speaking about TPS holders in general. That statement was not tied directly to Haiti. He made other comments But the about predicate, Haiti. What, what, I, I'm trying to remember now, before he made that uh, comment, yes. was the discussion specifically about Haiti and El Salvador? The discussion was, as we've alleged, Your Honor, as I understood it, about TPS in general. The countries that were coming up immediately were Haiti and El Salvador. So you would, you would contend that his reference was to all TPS uh, holders? Yes, Your Honor, and we think that's also supported by the allegations about the pressure that the White House put on the Department of Homeland Security, even in advance of that meeting. In November, we've alleged that the um, Chief of Staff at the White House called the Acting Secretary Duke, put tremendous pressure on her to end Honduras, DPS for Honduras, in the context of saying the TPS program in general is contrary to the Trump administration's uh, goals on immigration. Well, I'm not sure that supports your claim of, of racial or ethnic or color animus, because if, if it's to end TPS generally as an immigration matter, which raises the question, you know, if, if there's a general attitude about immigration, uh, you might even call that anti-immigrant sort of sentiment, that's not necessarily racial animus. That could be, so I'm not sure, I, I was puzzled by that reference, I'm not sure how that supports your claim, a general uh, pressure to end and, and tighten up the TPS program is not necessarily one that's expressly, expressly race-based. Let me, let me clarify, Your Honor, and I think you take that pressure is relevant to, one, the President's involvement in the entire process and whether you could have hold the Secretary uh, responsible um, for the President's animus infecting the, the process, but it, it is also relevant because we've alleged that, that the President's position on the TPS program is due to his animus towards immigrants from non-white, non-European countries. So the TPS holders are from specific countries, which the president contrasted to countries like Norway, uh, which are mostly white. And so it's not, our allegation is not that the, the administration was opposed to TPS because they were exposed, opposed to the program, but that they, TPS was contrary to their overall goals, which were motivated by intentional discrimination toward non-white, non-European immigrants. All right. Uh, yeah, go ahead. If I could address for a minute, Your Honor, the standard of review. Yes. Um, in the government's primary argument here is that um, rational basis review applies, and because the Federal Register itself doesn't make any race-based claims, they should pass rational basis review. Obviously, we, Arlington Heights, um, it's our position that Arlington Heights applies. But the government cannot satisfy any standard of review here. They've pointed to no case, and we're aware of no case, that has applied rational basis review to a claim of intentional race-based discrimination. But even under rational basis review, a law that's motivated by animus would fail to pass constitutional muster that's clear from Claiborne and Moreno. And as I understand it, the government's response to that is, well, to allege animus in the immigration context, you need to show outrageous discrimination. And they cite the AADC case that is a case, Your Honor, that is about selective enforcement claims. It's fundamentally different than this claim. AADC was a situation where you had people who were in violation of the law, who were challenging their prosecution for violation of the law on the basis of the prosecutor's motive. Um, the result of that, the court was concerned that the result of success on that kind of challenge would be to delay prosecution of a violation of law or in the immigration context to permit an ongoing violation of law. Our plaintiffs are not in violation of law. This is not an issue where the government is choosing from among a set of people who are in violation of law who to prosecute, and we're challenging their motive in doing that. Um, and I think the, the Ninth Circuit in the Kwai Fun Wong case was quite clear that AADC is limited to that kind of selective enforcement context, and that it does not apply when you are challenging denial of an immigration benefit on the basis of discriminatory animus. All right. Well, let's, let me hear from the government on, on that. Um, uh, 
your assertion that the proper standard of review here is the AADC standard. Why is this, uh, where is there an assertion of prosecutorial or an impingement upon prosecutorial discretion? It's not prosecution here. This is really, uh, has to do with the implementation of a statute. Well, Your Honor, it's important to note that the AADC framework has been uh, applied, um, particularly in the NCERS cases, to immigration laws that were uh, distinguished on the basis of, of countries. You know, in, the NCERS was the uh, selective registration system and uh, at least the first and the seventh circuits applied AADC and that rational basis framework to the requirement that individuals from certain countries uh, have to register. Well, uh, but didn't that, wasn't that in the context, uh, remind me, was that in the context of uh, either prosecution or removal proceeding? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Yeah. So, that, that makes some difference, does it not? I mean, uh, you, one could analogize uh, removal. Once you get into removal proceedings, it's perhaps similar to a prosecution. And to say that people are selectively uh, being, you know, uh, chosen uh, for removal uh, in a way that uh, is, is based on some impermissible, allegedly impermissible criteria, and therefore uh, seek, seeking court intervention to try to stop that, it's similar. Uh, maybe it's not, it's not a criminal law enforcement, but it is a law enforcement action um, that's analogous to kind of a prosecution for purposes of the selective prosecution doctrine. So I could kind of see that. But here, we're not at that stage, it seems to me. Uh, well, the, but the, the predicates that would put us in that stage are like the NCERS cases. I mean, you had uh, specific requirements from individuals for specific countries that you know, were distinguishing based upon national origin and NCERS. And here you have country-specific determinations that are not about the characteristics of individuals from these countries, but are about the conditions in those countries on the ground. And the, it, in, in both cases, the, 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 the framework is, is going to be an AADC framework because of the immigration context. Well, but that suggests that any kind of decision, even if it's one based on uh, invidious factors, if it is a predicate to later removal or later some kind of individualized uh, uh, process where there's some sanction uh, would be kind of forced under the framework of AADC, AADC would be a pretty sweeping proposition. That would mean normal constitutional review would be constrained even if you're not actually in a prosecution. Well, it, it, it might be sweeping, Your Honor, but in the context of, of, of immigration, where you're challenging the, you know, the executive's ability to weigh a myriad of factors, of foreign policy factors, humanitarian considerations, domestic political considerations, that the, the deference to that, to, you know, that decision-making process is what AADC and the NCERS cases, you know, even outside of the prosecutorial discretion context, are counseling. Well, that's two different doctrines. One is a concern about the separation of powers in the court not intervening uh, too forcefully in, a, in the prosecutorial uh, discretion area, um, which is one thing. The mantle of immigration law and the deference to Congress's plenary power, that, that's, that's that's a different matter. I mean, that's another basis for deference and, and a court treading very lightly, but it's not based on the prosecutorial discretion. So I'm just, and I think AADC is really about prosecutorial discretion, selective prosecution. Just one thing on that, Your Honor. The, the, the reason for the deference applies with equal force here, because whether it's prosecutorial discretion or the weighing of the country conditions, both are inherently executive functions. So if, if for that reason, AADC would not be limited to just the prosecutorial discretion context, but it would apply also to a context here where you have you know, an inherently discretionary assessment in consultation with other uh, government agencies about what the realities on the ground in a country like Sudan or Nicaragua or El Salvador or Haiti are. That the, the rationale for deferring to prosecutorial discretion it applies with equal force to the rationale. It would apply with equal force to, to deferring to the discretion 
uh, in assessing the, the factors that rele are relevant to TPS here? Well, um, that may be a reason why the statute and Congress enacted a statute to generally bar review of substantive decisions, and I think that's acceded to by the plaintiff if there was a decision based on analysis of the facts on the merits um, the courts are not going to second guess, you know, sort of the Secretary's assessment of on the ground conditions. But if the decision proves to be motivated by racial animus uh, and not, uh, 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 you know, by an actual assessment of things on the ground, uh, I'm not sure there's a reason for deference there because then the, the whole reason to defer to the expertise of the agency and the, the weighing of various considerations. Um, if that's not what's really at play, then there's no basis for that kind of deference. So, I mean, I think the two sort of dovetail that uh, unless you get out of that box and if you can prove this was motivated by uh, a reason that's not based on the merits, there would be very, very limited judicial review. But if you can prove that, then it seems to me that normal scrutiny, strict scrutiny would apply to any governmental decision as it would apply to any governmental decision. What, what's your view about... Um, I guess, again, we'll may find out more within days uh, how we are supposed to assess comments and evidence. But the fact here that there's proximity between the alleged, the, the comments that, that are cited by the plaintiff, um, uh, the president's comments about shithole countries and, and comparing uh, TPS countries to like Norway as an example, that it was within a short time, I think one week before I think the first uh, decision was made with respect to Haiti, I, or was it Haiti? I, I think I, I might be confused on the time frame. I think those comments were made after um, Sudan and Nicaragua. After? After. And then, but before, well, it was within a week. Is that, I recall that there was a, I'm fuzzy I mean, on the exact time frame. But but within a short time. So, um, I mean, whatever the record, I mean, it, 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 wouldn't that normally be deemed fairly probative if this were just a, any other case, uh, comments made by the decision maker that shed some light on that decision maker's attitude in connection with the transaction close in time, it seems like that would be given weight in a normal case. Well, if this were a normal sort of employment discrimination case, uh, yes, Your Honor. But you know, this is not an employment discrimination context or, the, or that other sort of set of contexts. But I mean, the same logic would apply. I mean, the reason why it's given weight in an employment context or in a zoning context or any other decision-making context is that just logically, if, you know, the closer in time it is, the more likely it may shed light in, in, uh, on what the decision-maker was thinking at the time. Well, Your Honor, again, this is, uh, you know, plaintiffs have expressed their view on this argument, but you know, we have a congressionally designated decision maker who is a cabinet secretary who makes these decisions. And that, that is a, a reason why this isn't a normal context. And the, which, it, for that reason, President's comments are, you know, our positions that are irrelevant to the decision making process here. And in fact, that some of Plano's allegations are actually self-refuting on this. You know, they make a lot of Secretary Kelly's alleged pressure on Acting Secretary Duke regarding Honduras. Yeah. She did not ter terminate Honduras. Well. Similarly, with, South, with Sudan, she extended uh, South Sudan. And Secretary Nielsen has ex extended Syria. So you know, the, when you look at the particular allegations of, you know, discriminatory pressure here, they, they, they fall apart under that scrutiny. Well, that, that's a factual question, and I, I know you've raised that. It, it sort of shows that there was not perfect control, it, uh, uh, even assuming that the, the President's agenda was to end TPS status for any non-white country. Uh, that didn't happen in, in at least uh, three instances. But the fact that it happened in, in four other instances may be evidence to the contrary. But that's an evidentiary question. Um, I think their theory is that even though the charge decision maker by statute was the secretary, if the secretary was in fact uh, acting under the pressure or influence uh, of the, the of the president, then as any under typical discrimination theory, 
those who exerted some influence or pressure, their state of mind can be imputed for uh, liability liability purposes to the ultimate decision maker. Well, you know, as, as you're aware, there's other pending litigation on this. Uh, you know, the Casa de Maryland case um, uh, rejected this argument. Uh, Batala v. Dow has been certified for interlocutory appeal. Um, and you know, there, the, you, there are other courts considering this issue, but in, in all of these cases, it is our position that when you're dealing with a cabinet secretary who has the authority to make these decisions as delegated by Congress, that this sort of undue pressure cat's paw theory falls apart. Simply because that's the person that was designated to exercise the ultimate power? Uh, yes, that, that distinguishes it from a case of a middle manager in the employment context or, you know, the, these other sort of contexts. I, I'm not sure. I mean, ultimately, somebody's a decision maker. In this case, it's designated by statute. In many cases, you have to figure out who the decision maker was. Was it the supervisor, the manager, the CEO? But once you've determined who that, located who that decision maker is, you also look at those who influenced the decision maker in determining whether or not there was unlawful discrimination or other um, invidious type of conduct that was going on. And so I'm not sure the fact that Congress has identified who the ultimate responsible decision maker is would insulate and prevent review of who the other influencing factors were and whether or not they were tainted uh, by some unlawful motivation. I, I, I'm not aware of, you know, wh why that would be. Well, they, it, fair enough, Your Honor. Um, you know, the, it, this is our position, and you know, we'll also have a Ninth Circuit decision in DACA that could that will said shed some light on this, perhaps. All right. Um, let, let me go to the ADA theory then, um, let, and let me ask you. I understand, you know, there's a whole question of jurisdiction whether we even get to this on the merits. But if we were to, and I understand the government's denial that there was a change in rule, there is no, quote, new rule, a new interpretation. Um, but if there is jurisdiction, if a new rule or new interpretation is found to have been applied here that is different and discreetly different from the, the prior process, why wouldn't then that be problematic under the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, uh, particularly under the FCC versus Fox television case that said that uh, agency has, you can't depart from prior policy or practice sub silentio, you have to at least give good reasons for it, some explanation, and go through a, a process? Well, the explanations are given as required by statute in the Federal Register notices. They're set out there. There is no other source of publication for guidelines for interpretation. Well, that's an explanation of the substantive decision, why status is being terminated for, for Haiti and for El Salvador. What is not explained, and I know it is hard for you to do because your, your client uh, denies that there was a change, but if there was a change, there's no explanation why that change was made, why the, uh, the Secretary is no longer considering, for instance, current conditions. Not to uh, avoid the question, but on that point, Your Honor, we are not conceding that the secretaries did not in consider intervening conditions. No, I know that. I, I know that's a dispute because you, in, in some of the termination notices, it talks about some current, like in Sudan, for instance. Right. Um, so just to be clear, we're not conceding that we right. did not do that. Um, that uh, on the other hand, if you look just on the face of the notices compared to the extension notices, the previous extension notice and the current termination notice, there are a number of uh, uh, factors that were just not addressed. Um, if you look at El Salvador and some of these other countries, um, the termination, the extension notice uh, noted certain things, uh, uh, problems, but they, they were not, uh, it was just silent in that regard. So sometimes they're addressed, sometimes they're not. And, and I would, that would be true for every TPS term, termination since uh, you know, the H.W. Bush administration. I think if you look at them all, you will see that you know, some are, are voluminous in their discussion, some are pretty uh, somewhat short. Um, the it, prior it, terminations also uh, uh, omitted discussion of the previous condition that had been cited in the right. preceding notice. If, if you 
reading the prior Federal Register notices, you can't discern any pattern where of consistency where every single factor that was ever mentioned in the prior extension is rebutted in the termination. It's just not the way that these have been handled. Well, that, that does raise a, a disputed issue, but uh, assuming for the moment that uh, if the plaintiff were able to, they were able to prevail and show that there was a significant substantive, or they put it, sudden change, um, would that not, wouldn't that be problematic under the APA since there's no explanation for that, no, no, no uh, reason set forth? Uh, no, Your Honor. The, the, uh, again, not getting to like the merits of whether this, this actually happened. The, you know, none of the cases that plaintiffs cite for the APA claim are like the situation here. They all involve some sort of prior public notice given to the public about how the agency was going to administer or prosecute a particular statute. There are you know, none of the reliance interests that those types of uh, public statements would have engendered are at issue here. And this is a temporary humanitarian program applied by different administrations over, you know, since I guess 1991. And you know, to try to stitch together a policy based upon inferences in the Federal Register notices and imply one that exists and then th that would be binding on future administrations unless there was a public statement that they were changing course you know, would be outside of the framework of the APA. Are, are you suggesting there has to be a sort of proven reliance interest in order to uh, implicate the APA's requirement of some reason explanation for a change? Not that, that, that there's a, a reliance requirement, but that in, in all of the cases that plaintiffs cite, you're dealing with formalized public communications, like either a proposed rulemaking or as an FCC v. Fox, you, know, you had interpretive guidelines that the FCC was publishing about its fleeting expletive, pol expletive policy. And the, in, I mentioned reliance in that context because it, it is there where, in that context, where the Supreme Court and Fox, F the FCC says, you know, the, the agency has to give some reason to explain what it's doing after, when, and notify that it's doing so. W without any prior express policy, there is, there would be no requirement to publish on the website or anywhere else how they were administering TPS. Well, uh, I know you would argue that um, Fox, for instance, uh, the FCC Fox case uh, is different because it concerned formal policies and regulations, but um, the APA principle about having to at least discuss and explain changes have, have been applied to practices, not just formal policies. In the American Wild Horse uh, case versus Purdue, I think that was a practice regarding how certain lands were treated. Uh, I don't think there was a formal regulation, as I recall. But it's not so much that it was a formal regulation, but that it was a public policy that had been in place for two decades, I believe, or maybe more than two decades. And, um, well, I, I take it uh, what we're going to hear from the plaintiffs is that there's been a public policy or practice of uh, accounting for intervening current circumstances uh, before terminating, and, and that is the change. I mean, it, it was public in a sense that if you look at all the explanations and the extensions, um, what the practice was is, is made evident and was public. So why is that any different? Uh, well, maybe this just collapses to the merits that that's just not the case. Right. And, and Your Honor, also, I, I know that we started this, this uh, hypothetical with the proviso that there was jurisdiction, but I just want to reiterate that the APA itself would you know, deprive the plaintiffs of this court of jurisdiction over that claim because of, of Section 1254A. Right, the jurisdiction stripping yeah. provision, right. right, which is why I started, because that's a threshold question, and if, if the government prevails on that, then n none of this is cognizable. Or, uh, uh, I just so. wanted to uh, reiterate that point. All right. Let, let, let me hear the response regarding the uh, APA. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'll start with this question of whether a rule has to be explicitly and formally written down for this um, general principle that an agency must explain past departures to apply. Um, 
as Your Honor said, many of the cases that we've cited do not involve that situation. So in American Wild Horses, it was a practice over years. Um, and also the... Um, was that practice embodied in any or described in any public... Um, in other words, here there's kind of an implicit, you're asserting an implicit practice, an implicit policy. In Wild Horse, was that implicit or explicit, the practice of uh, uh, how certain lands were treated? I think the case most on point with implicit practice is the FERC case, but the, the Wild Horse, the FERC case, the California Public Utilities versus FERC, in Wild Horses, the situation was that the, the agency was taking a very similar position to the government. Here, they were denying that there had been any rule that was ever changed. And in rejecting that argument, the court looked in part to practice. So the agency had to count the number of horses that were in this disputed territory. And they said, in your reports where you count the number of horses, you counted the horses from this middle territory. So clearly, you thought the middle territory was part of the reserve. Um, there was also an original forest plan that was incorporated by reference into another document that said that the reserve was part of the, um, or sorry, that this disputed territory was part of the reserve. So the court looked to both things. Um, the FERC case is a case where the rule really was embodied in individual decisions, just as in our case. So the um, over the course of deciding several cases, the, the issue had to do with whether you could give an incentive to a utility company for being part of a group that it had no discretion to leave. So there were incentives given to electricity companies when they made a voluntary choice to join certain groups. And the question was, could you give the incentive to a utility company that had no choice but to be part of this group? And in the past, the agency had always denied, in individual cases, the utility company would ask for the benefit and they would say no because your participation in this group is, is not voluntary, so you don't get an incentive to induce your behavior. They changed that not in a formal announcement but in a decision granting an incentive to a utility company that was part of this group and had no discretion to leave. And so the, the, the policy, and, and the court actually says this in the decision, but the, the, the policy that was departed from was embodied in, in prior decisions. Um, it's also the case in the Bonville Power Administration case, Your Honor, where the, the practice that was departed from was that the agency would always fund a fish passage center whenever this other body had recommended they do so. It was just in a practice. They didn't have any rule always fund them when the other body says. So it was just a practice. So. All right, well, that brings up the question, how clear, and maybe this is the factual dispute here, um, your theory, your APA theory, and perhaps your, um, in part, uh, your seeking to avoid the, the jurisdictional stripping provision hinges on the existence of a new um, policy or practice. What's your response factually to the fact that if you look at earlier terminations, they, many of them also did not refer to prior extension conditions and, and one could argue it looks like they, you know, there's no clear pattern here that uh, you don't always consider all uh, conditions. Well, Your Honor, when the first thing I, I want to clarify is that this practice of considering intervening conditions and describing the intervening conditions and the extensions and terminations is one that developed over time. So the initial termination and extension notices are quite cursory. That oh, There's a giant folder there with all of them. But the initial notices in the 1990s are, are quite cursory. It's around 2000 where you start to see more detailed explanations in both the extensions and the terminations. Um, Obviously, you can't have one rule for terminations and one rule for extensions, so you, you can't only, only look at one. Um, as Your Honor has noted, this is, this is a factual question, so to the extent there's any ambiguity about what was considered at, the, at this stage, it, it has to be construed in the light most favorable to the plaintiffs, but we, there is a clear difference between the factors, the intervening factors that are considered before the Trump administration and after about 2000. Because before that, the, the, the notices just say very little. Um, but there's a clear difference between the reasons that are given in that 17-year time period and the reasons that are given under the Trump administration. Well, We've also is, it, is it accurate that there were prior terminations that didn't address all of the immediately preceding extension justifications? The government has cherry-picked a few examples that, that, that they have discussed in their brief that they argue show a failure to consider intervening conditions in terminations. Um, at best, we think 
we, we think those are cherry picked examples and that the overwhelming pattern is to consider intervening conditions in both extension and termination notices. To the extent there is no pattern and the government sometimes considers them and sometimes doesn't, that would also be a violation of the APA to apply one rule in one case and another rule in another case arbitrarily. I don't recall that being a theory you advanced. I thought your theory is that there's a change, not that there's been inconsistencies from time to time, and therefore prior administrations may have violated the APA as well. I thought your position is that this administration has violated the APA because of a sudden and new change. So that's, that's a different theory. You're correct, Your Honor, and I apologize if I was confusing. That is our position. In response to the, the government's argument in our opposition brief, we point out that if the court accepted their version of the facts as true, and sometimes factors are considered and sometimes they aren't, that, that is a different APA violation. That's not the one that we have alleged here, but that also would violate the APA. Are, are there any cases that say how, how much of a change, how clean, how categorical a change must be in order to invoke uh, the requirement of uh, providing good reasons, et cetera, et cetera? For that, if, if there's a subtle shift from, you know, 60% explanation to 40% explanation instead of zero to 100, 100 to zero, are there any cases that that say at what point, how significant, how substantial, how sweeping, how complete must a change be before the APA is implicated? There aren't any cases I'm aware of, Your Honor, that directly address the question, but you can look at the changes that have where the court has applied this test. So in, um, in the Fox case, for example, the change was, is one expletive enough to count as indecency or could two count as indecency? And the court explicitly notices that, uh, noted that the agency didn't change the definition of indecency, it just changed how it was applied. There's also in the Bonville Power Administration case, Your Honor, that- But I'm there you could see what the change was in a fairly graphic way, right? I mean, here, you're looking at a pattern. I mean, you're, as you say, I mean, they cherry pick, but if they, if they can cherry pick enough, it doesn't, then it begins to look like not so discreet a pattern. If there's enough examples of that. So the question is not how, I apologize, Sharon, I think I was misunderstanding the question, not how subtle the change has to be, but how clearly the change has to be expressed. I guess that's a better way of putting it, yes. We have, we think that the change is clear, Your Honor, from the notices, but we have also alleged numerous statements that reflect a change. And so it's not just the notices, but it's, um, you know, for example, Secretary Nielsen saying, the law does not allow me to look at the conditions of a country writ large. Compare that statement with pre-Trump extension and termination notices, there is a clear change. All right. now. Um, to the extent that raises a factual issue, um, why isn't this, explain to me again, why is this not, to go back to the first question, a fact-based challenge to jurisdiction as opposed to a facial challenge? And if it's a fact-based challenge, doesn't this court have the, isn't it uh, charged with having to resolve that fact? Because the government's position, Your Honor, is that there is no jurisdiction over our claims, regardless of whether we can prove a new rule or not. Their position is that the court doesn't have jurisdiction to consider whether there has been a rule change. So it's the nature of their challenge. They're saying even if true, there's still no jurisdiction. That is how I understand it, Your Honor. And we, we briefed this in our brief from yesterday, and my co-counsel may be able to elaborate But that. All right, well, let me clarify from the government. I, I know that is your, arg your argument. You've made that argument. But and, and is that the gist of your jurisdictional challenge, that even if they could prove it, the statute is so broad and sweeping and un unconditional that it bars judicial review. That, that is our position, Your Honor, yes. And if, if there was one thing I might add to the APA discussion. Yeah. Uh, this theory of bringing this within the rubric of the APA threatens to imperil the TPS framework itself. Because it, wouldn't, it would not just be terminations that would be, then be subject to litigation. It would be the designations in the first instance or refusal to designate. But you could imagine a situation where a future secretary designated a country for TPS and someone who was opposed to that for whatever reason brought it 
brought an APA lawsuit saying that, you know, the factors weren't considered in the way that they were by prior administrations, that there was a departure from practice. Each of the legal theories advanced here would imperil the TPS framework itself by allowing that sort of challenge. And so I think that that is, you know, that's another reason why Congress added the, or, or barred judicial review here. Um, but I think that that is a, a consequence of, of uh, you know, the way that this case has been litigated if it were allowed to go forward. All right. Let me get a response to that. Uh, wouldn't your theory have implications for not just terminations, but extensions or designations in the first place? Any change in, alleged change in criteria could implicate uh, scrutiny? It, it's hard to think of who would have standing or how the challenge to the extension would come up. but but. The jurisdictional argument that we present, Your Honor, certainly is not limited to terminations. It applies to. No, I'm talking about the APA argument, the substance pardon, of the APA pardon argument. Me, pardon me. Yes, the rule, the rule change, the argument that you can't change rules without giving an explanation is not limited to a termination. Although in the termination, there are unique reliance interests which are relevant as far as how detailed the explanation needs to be. And I think the government argued that there were no reliance interests because this policy is not written down, but certainly the TPS holders have come over the years to rely on the fact that their country's TPS designations are extended. They are aware of the conditions in their country, and they've come to rely on the fact that they are not going to be made to return to their countries until those conditions um, have improved, and they have come to rely on the fact that that assessment is made looking at the conditions written well, down, not in this narrow way. Let me ask you, now you raised that point, aren't those expectation interests as opposed to reliance interests? Usually reliance interests is a change in position and reliance on something, something you've done that you would not have done otherwise, and I'm not sure what that would be here. I mean, people may expect that they were going to be able to stay here longer, but it is a temporary, they, nobody was promised a permanent status here. Um, so I'm not sure what, there's no example in the complaint of what people have done in reliance that they would not have done had they known. It's really an expectation interest that is based on an expectation they'd be, certain rules would apply before the TPS status would be terminated. It's a, it's a reliance interest, Your Honor, in that, and the, the example that we give in the complaint that I think is most goes to this question is that uh, plaintiff, Hawaida Alarbi, for example, she's held TPS for 20 years. In 2015, she made a decision to invest in a restaurant. She made a decision to start her own business. When the TPS termination was announced, she sold that business because of the uncertainty and she sold it at a loss. So people are making decisions about their lives that are different from the decisions they might make if they thought they would have to return to their countries before conditions in their country had actually significantly improved. Another example, Your Honor, is we have several plaintiffs who are, you know, college students. We have plaintiff uh, Maria Jose Ayala Flores has decided to study math in college because she wants to be a math teacher. If she thought that she was going to have to return to her country, she might make a different decision about what to study. So we do think they are reliance interests and not just expectation interests, Your Honor. What would be the reliance interests there? You mean studying a different subject or not going to college or what? I'm not sure I understand. I think the choices that are made yeah, it could be to not go to college and to instead get a degree in whatever job is most in need in the other country. Um, decisions are being made with the assumption that people are able to stay and won't have to return to their countries until conditions have improved. And I do think people would make different decisions about what to study, about whether to go to college, about what job to take, about what business to invest in. Um, I guess the hard thing about that, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I think the hard part about that is that it's not like, you know, you're guaranteed to stay here 10 years, now we're shortening it to five years. It's always, it's six months, six months, 12 months, 12 months, maybe 18 months, and, and it's subject to periodic review, and it is, uh, and especially given the lack of judicial review on the merits, it's not so much based on, you know, objective conditions on the ground by itself, but the Secretary's assessment of that which is largely unreviewable under the statute. So the reliance interests seem to be tempered to, to some extent. Uh, In a practical way, the reliance interest is the assumption that the secretary, maybe the decision is non-reviewable, but that it will be made in a non-arbitrary way and that there won't be this sudden change when 
from the plaintiff's awareness of what's going on in their country, nothing has really changed, but the decision that comes out is completely different and is not in line with the decisions that have been made for the previous 20 years. All right. Um, let, let's talk about the, the discovery issues. I know some of this is sort of conditional on what this court decides on the merits. Um, but if we assume for the moment that uh, I find that the jurisdictional stripping provision of 1254A uh, does not preclude either the constitutional claims or the challenge to the procedural broader systemic uh, change in criteria that the plaintiff allows, uh, that determination is, is uh, uh, to be narrowly construed to mean the individual country by country determination, um, which is fact based. Uh, and that at least there's an APA uh, claim that's been stated once we get past the jurisdictional uh, issue and at least as alleged an equal protection claim. Um, I'm, I'm less certain about the uh, due process claims, uh, but assuming there is a constitutional claim and an APA claim that goes forward, what do we do about discovery? And how does this fit into a larger time frame in terms of what is happening? Because uh, we have to look forward in terms of what the sequence of events are. I guess the first uh, TPS holders that will be affected are uh, those from Sudan in November, and then followed by, what's the next country? Nicaragua in January. Um, and should this case uh, proceed, um, we need to give ourselves enough time to adjudicate whatever we're going to have to adjudicate. And I want to be able to do that time enough so that uh, whoever doesn't prevail will have a chance to seek appellate relief or appellate review. So I don't want to wait till the last minute, which is one reason why I said at the first CMC that I want to make sure that we don't get hung up on discovery or the record and not be able to address the merits of these claims. So I, I guess the first question I have with respect to this dispute that's ongoing with regard to discovery um, is assuming that an administrative record has to be put together and produced. Um, what is in the administrative record? And the administrative record generally um, it should include things that are, that are broad, uh, anything that was directly or indirectly uh, considered uh, by the agency decision makers. And so that would seem to encompass uh, not just formal communications, uh, putting aside privileges, but it would, it would anything that was considered directly or indirectly. And that would include things that were considered and seen by those who helped the decision maker under the, the law as I understand it. Um, so I want to get, get the party sense of, and, and if that's the case, I'm not sure what else outside the record would be needed here, but uh, let me hear from the government first, because you've begun to look at the potential administrative records, I understand. In compiling them, uh, yes, yes, Your Honor. Um, the, so it, as you said, it would be whatever the secretary herself considered, and then for whatever who was advising the secretary, what they considered. And at this point, we've identified 15 people who would have had input to the secretaries at one time or another, and are looking through their materials to see you know, what they relied upon and what, you know, their, what they have that might be comprised part of the record. Um, it is, you know, because we're still reviewing the materials, uh, we have, I think as we mentioned in the letter, about, uh, down to about 35,000 materials from 20 custodians. Um, you know, obviously those are not all part of the record, but that's the universe of materials that we're reviewing. Um, and we're also interviewing other people who might have potentially had some input that would have met the criteria of someone who was advising the secretary. Now, uh, your letter refers to uh, including formal recommendations and assessments by other government agencies, uh, but it will exclude informal deliberations. Yes, uh, sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what that means. Informal, if they are considered directly or indirectly, at least they fall within a prima facie definition of what should be in administrative records. Maybe there's some privileges there, but I, it seems to me that I'm not sure what that means in formal. So, so I, I, in the context of that paragraph, Your Honor, what, I, what we were trying to say was that you know, 
we are including materials that would normally be deliberative because of the statutory framework. The statute requires DHS to consult with other relevant government agencies, so like the State Department, for instance. And so materials that in the, you know, in other types of APA cases would have been deliberative, we are going to be waiving uh, deliberative process privilege for those because of the statutory, statutory framework. Right. Um, and so in saying informal uh, deliberations, we were saying that we were, you know, that because although we were, you know, waiving privilege with respect to these things under the statute, uh, you know, informal communications and emails between various people uh, uh, would be excluded from the record. Why would those be excluded, uh, at least under the normal defini definition of an administrative record, as long as it was uh, uh, up for consideration, uh, uh, it was, again, even indirectly considered, it, it, it should be part of the administrative record? Well, I think the point was that they're informal deliberations, so that, you know, they're deliberative in nature, not you know, factual, and that the, the, the those are, as would be normal, we were with, we will be withholding. Is that because of the deliberative process privilege, or you don't think that that even falls within the definition of what's in the administrative record? Uh, well, it depends upon the particular document. Um, and sorry, the, it, it's hard, a little bit hard to answer that in the abstract. It, it, I, so I'd say both, Your Honor. I mean, because some would be deliberative process, and then others would be materials we would not consider to be part of the record. Or what's what's Who's going to argue on the part of the? Your Honor, I hope uh, after I finish this or at some point before we go, uh, you'll give us a chance just to say two or three very quick things on um, the uh, equal protection and uh, the due process claims. It'll be very fast. I hope you. Well, why don't you, if you, if you want to, you mean on the merits? Now. Yes. Well, uh, why don't you say that now? Because I, I want to move to the next stage. Sure, Your yeah. Honor. Just to refer the court to. This is now the children's claim. Martinez de Mendoza is a Third Circuit case that says that if you're going to an unsafe country, the analysis might be different on one of these de facto deportation claims. Israel v. INS, which is a Ninth Circuit case cited in the Bustamante decision, where they hold that conditioning a voluntary departure grant on a promise that the person not marry violates the right to family integrity. Um, and I, we cite those only to, to say that we do think there is balancing here. If your court agrees, if you can get us that far, then we're in a factual dispute and we'll bring experts to show the interests and things like that. So we should survive the motion to dismiss if there is any balancing at all to be done on the due process point. Um, and then the only other uh, point my co-counsel asked me to suggest was, I know the court is, uh, obviously it's very difficult for everyone the, with the Muslim ban decision coming. I wonder if we might allow supplemental briefing on the equal protection claim, depending on what the decision says. I, I may do that. Or could yeah. consider. Um, uh, on the discovery questions, Your Honor? Yes. The first thing we would want is for the defendants to respond to the discovery requests, uh, because we're past 30 days, you know, or, or the court to deem them waived, I suppose, is the other option. But uh, and we had the meet and confer uh, at the courts uh, because the court had ordered it on May 8th. And so the responses were due June 7th. So this is, I'm not talking here about the administrative record, the other discovery uh, requests that we've made. Those were very targeted, focused on the particular claims that we're uh, talking about here today. For example, the government said in our discussions, our meet and confer discussions, that there are documents responsive to it's interrogatory one, it's the only interrogatory, and uh, RFP one, which are uh, guidances or policies about what criteria to consider in the decision. That and that would be, that would fall within the rubric of an uh, administrative record, right? I don't know if it would or not. Uh, Why wouldn't it? Uh, well, because at least they, as they are defining it, I'm not sure that it would be something that was considered by the, uh, by the secretary. If there was law, say from 1995 and some policy guidance that then was, was the governing law and then the secretary never looked at it and then disregarded it, uh, then I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know what, they, what, what their conception is. But in our view, it doesn't matter whether it's not in the administrative record. It goes to um, the unexplained departure claim uh, it is an exception to the rule that you are limited to the administrative record. 
uh, under the Ninth Circuit law, the um, Center for Biological Diversity uh, case, which they cite, uh, says that if the agency has not explained its decision, that's one reason why you might be able to go outside the administrative record. Well, here there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. That is whether the, that there was a change in decision, and part of your discovery kind of goes to that question. So it's a little bit of a cart, which, which is the cart, which is the horse here. Well, I think, uh, but we, don't we get the benefit of the uh, chicken and egg difference there? Because we have pled that there is uh, a new rule, and now we get to, assuming that we have pled enough to survive a motion to dismiss, then we should be able to get discovery on that question. RFP 1, and, and it, shouldn't, it doesn't have to be limited to the administrative record if what we, the claim we're making is that there's an unexplained departure. So that's one. Another one, Your Honor, uh, uh, RFP 4 asks for communications with outside entities like Congress or some non-governmental organizations like anti-immigrant organizations asking for what communications they had with the government about TPS and what the government said to them. Those also might help to prove the equal protection claim or um, the new rule uh, claim. RFP 6 and 7 is about the testimony, the, the, the materials that were given to the secretaries when they presented their testimony. Uh, that's the testimony that I and my co-counsel were quoting to you, Your Honor, where they sure sound like they're saying that they're limited to the originating conditions. Uh, we've gotten no response to those. Uh, in, again, in our meet and confers, the government said, uh, we think, uh, I don't want to put words in my friend's mouth, but he's something like, uh, they have a person going to look to see if there is a packet of material that was given to the secretary to prepare them for the testimony. Um, we would like to see the documents that that has produced. They've had it now for almost 60 days. So that's, that's our sort of first ask about uh, discovery, separate from this administrative record question. And those, uh, the, oh, so the last one I should mention, Your Honor, the 30B6 deposition. So the ones that you are prioritizing are uh, uh, requests RFP 1, or 4, 6, 7, uh, the 30B6 deposition. I may be, these are in the brief we filed yesterday, Your Honor. So um, in, the, in the section of it about the old requests, I may be missing one, but that's, uh, that's one ask that we have. There are supplemental requests. Yes, so the supplemental requests, Your Honor, uh, I think they sort of circle back to this question we had at the very beginning about whether we should, uh, whether we're doing now um, jurisdictional discovery to prove subject matter jurisdiction. Um, well, and, 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 well, your position is that we don't need to because uh, the, the challenge that the government has brought is of a legal nature, the facial nature, and I have to resolve this really interpretation of 1254A is a, is a critical question, and if that, if I resolve that in favor of, of the plaintiffs, then there is at least jurisdiction um, for purposes of considering the rest of the case. Right, Your Honor, and, and so you, Your Honor's order said, tell us, tell, tell the court what you would ask for specifically. So we took that order seriously and we gave you exactly our current best guess as to what we would ask for. But I think what our preference would be be if the court were to say, um, uh, I find 1254A does not bar this claim, and so it can proceed under uh, summary judgment, then we'll, I mean, it'll, be, it'll look a lot like that, uh, but you know, we did that in two days. <laughs> so uh, you know, we would propound uh, perhaps some more very targeted discovery focused on uh, proving these particular claims. So your priority is right now, as we sit here, uh, is, is request for document productions one, four, six, and seven, and you say 30 B6 deposition that would. Is that about um, the document gathering process or the merits? It would be about the merits. I think it would be, I mean, it might cover, cover, cover some of the document gathering uh, process depending on how we timed it. But I think our primary concern in that would be the two areas. Is there an unexplained departure from prior practice? Was there a conscious, intentional uh, departure from the prior practice? And then second, race discrimination. And what are the mechanisms by which the uh, presidents and the sort of 
White House's uh, racist immigration imperatives were uh, brought to bear on the TPS decision-making process. Well, that's biting off a lot for a 30B6 deposition, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> perhaps, Your Honor. Um, maybe. Uh, but, but anyway, my, my point is those are the things uh, that we would prioritize because we're interested in targeted discovery f to get the preliminary injunctions uh, off the ground. And All right. Well, let me. Yeah. Go ahead. The you had asked about the timing for Sudan and uh, yes. Nicaragua. Uh, in our discussions, when they were describing the size of the administrative record that they want to produce, they're very small. Uh, and when you look at these requests that we have focused on as well, I suspect the volume of documents for at least the ones that I just mentioned to you must be extremely small. Uh, and so. We don't believe that there's a justification for uh, limiting those to only one or two countries. And also just thinking out, and of course this is knock on wood, only if we win the, uh, defeat the motion to dismiss. But if we don't do it that way, Your Honor, we're going to file seriatim preliminary injunction motions, which is going to be. Um, so what you, what you are intending is, is one, uh, master preliminary injunction hearing if we have we may have enough already uh, we've done a lot more investigation since we were here a month ago but uh, if we got this discovery responses um, and my conception of what these discovery responses are i would think would apply across the decision making process generally our hope would be to file one preliminary injunction motion and, and let me ask uh, whether you call it jurisdictional discovery or not i mean one of your burdens uh, it seems to me is to make your case that there has in fact been a change and that there is a I mean that's a lot of what we've been discussing Did the supplemental requests go to that question on the merits some of them go to that question and some of them go to equal protection uh, uh, questions and I'm, I'm prepared to talk about if you have questions I'm prepared to talk about those particular requests some of them are very specific as I'm sure you can uh, see but my, our main reason for raising this point about whether it's uh, jurisdictional discovery or instead uh, sort of pre-summary judgment discovery is because we would prefer not to have had to produce that uh, now and instead be allowed to get the responses to the discovery we propounded, we propounded 60 days ago, see what's in there, and then uh, you know perhaps proceed further and it, it seems somewhat uh, unfair. Obviously, the court has been extremely fair. I don't mean to suggest in general. But we shouldn't have to uh, do jurisdictional discovery now on what is a merits question without first seeing the responses to the discovery that we already propounded. And uh, you know, as I said, we read Your Honor's comments last time to say that we ought now to be in a, dis in a position to discuss uh, the actual discovery disputes. And obviously we can't do that because they haven't responded. We don't know. Uh, they haven't said that they have documents or don't specifically. They haven't said what uh, objections they're going to raise. So that's why our, our position, and they've, they've blown their deadline on responding. So what, you know. What's your position with respect to uh, uh, production of the administrative record? L let's say uh, discovery is ordered, a response are ordered to these, uh, at least to the, the request for production. And we'll have to talk about the 30B deposition. What's your uh, view about the production of the uh, administrative record? Uh, given the size that they have described it to be, uh, the court should order uh, that should produce it in 14 days. Uh, should order that. It, excuse me. Should order that it be produced. I think we said four to 10 days rolling production, and then um, 14 for objections. So assuming there's not a basis to, uh, yeah. So then uh, you know it either be 10 days or. Uh, 14 days and also your honor this is something from the regents order that if they are excluding evidence from the administrative record based on uh, what would have been an assertion of privilege the discussion that you and my friend were having earlier that they log that so that we treat the documents that would otherwise have been properly in the administrative record but were excluded on the basis of privilege as though they are withheld documents for which we could then challenge. All right. And, and looking forward, what is the timing of the next series of events here, given the, the, what's going to happen 
uh, towards the end of the year, in November? Uh, we, we want to file, we haven't figured out the exact uh, uh, timing, but I think somewhere in August, September, somewhere in there, uh, we want to file the preliminary injunction motion. And so we want the documents in two weeks uh, if we're no later than that, you know, and then, and then if we're going to have discovery disputes, as Your Honor had suggested, uh, we'll have them during the summer. Uh, as for interlocutory, I don't know if it would be interlocutory, but uh, appeals, Your Honor, if any of the case survives, our preference would just be to do it simultaneously, uh, which I know is hard for everyone, but it's really hard for our clients to uh, live with this you know, sort of hammer hanging over their heads and the decisions that they're making are extremely, extremely hard. So I think if we have to litigate in, two, in the Ninth Circuit and in the district court at the same time, I think we'd rather do that than, um, than wait longer to put them in even more of a difficult position as the deadlines come closer. You mean to have an omnibus, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, you mean to, to have one single preliminary injunction hearing? Correct, Your Honor. I was just referring to, uh, Your Honor had said, oh, well, whichever way my ruling goes, uh, we might want time for, on the motion to dismiss, I mean, we might, might want time for interlock, I mean, uh, appellate review. I was talking about appellate review if we got to the stage of preliminary injunction, because that's where the rubber hits the road. Understood, I wasn't talking about granting uh, uh, 1252 interlocutory appeal on a motion to dismiss, because that would be time enough. And that's why I want to advance the preliminary injunction, because then the merits of whatever we rule today here, if it goes forward, can be heard in one, rather than trying to chop it off in pieces. But it does put a premium in getting this heard well in advance of the November date. So you're looking at a sub August or September filing. Yes, we, to be honest with you, we haven't uh, internally talked to, to fix a date because we uh, wanted to to come here and, and uh, argue the motion to dismiss, but uh, we'd be happy to provide uh, very shortly with the court, uh, to the court and to uh, the government, the date by which we'll file the preliminary injunction. All right, well, let me, Eddie. Oh, we already set a date, I guess. We set a date for the hearing, yeah, which was September something, I can't remember. The motion to August 23rd? Oh, August 23rd, yeah, thank you so much. Get ahead of ourselves. We did set a date already. So that means discovery matters have to be resolved quickly. I apologize, Your Honor. I, I had uh, forgotten that we had just fixed that precise date. All right. Let me, let me hear from the government uh, response. What, what's wrong with producing um, responses to uh, requests for reductions 1, 4, 6, and 7? If we're moving past the uh, record for the, the moment, Your Honor, yeah. I could just give you an update on where we are. Um, for, for number four, I, that is an exceptionally broad request that involve, would involve looking through the files of numerous agency people. I mean, this is you know, not a targeted, discreet request. But the subject matter is fairly discreet. It's about the decision to extend or terminate the designations for these four countries, which all occurred after, uh, uh, what, what was the first decision date uh, or, or discussion? Of this? 2017, I believe. Uh, it's interrogatory number one, it sets the date of November 8th, 2016. I forget yes. what the significance of that date is. Is that... Uh, it was the election date is the oh okay yeah that was the election date wasn't it <laughs> so it, it means uh, for a period of about a year um, maybe a little more than a year about these four and I don't know how many I mean so I, maybe maybe it would help uh, elucidate this point if I yeah. sort of gave you the numbers and what we have for yeah. some of the other so for some of the requests that were uh, th that we were able to formulate you know, meaningful search terms for, for example, request number two and three, we have found a total of almost 7,000 documents. For six and seven, and it's uh, 14,000 documents and families. For six and seven? Uh, no, that was for two and three. Oh. For six and seven, we're looking at about 13,000 documents based on our current search terms. 
those are the number of documents used to prepare uh, uh, Secretary Kelly and then Secretary Nielsen for their uh, we're, testimony? We're, we're reviewing them to make sure that they're responsive, but based on the, those are the numbers that, that have come back for uh, the search terms we formulated for those. And similarly, it's for a little hard to believe that uh, the secretary reviewed 12,000 documents to prepare for. I mean, maybe I underestimate. Uh, <laughs> uh, I assume that would be narrower once. Well, go ahead. It, it, well, it, it probably will be narrower once they're actually reviewed. You know, these the search terms are just the first sort of step yeah. in, in trying to isolate these documents. Yeah. I'm just trying to give you a sense of you know, how much material is out there because of. The, you know, the, you know, the, the vastness of the government agencies and the number of people and custodians involved. You know, this, this isn't a situation where there's just, you know, one file box with everything. Um, and so. But it's a pretty discreet subject matter. I mean, if you look, the, the key seems to be one and four. One is uh, um, statements, documents uh, about what factors to consider and whether to extend or terminate. Um, you know, I, I I don't know how much there will be. That that's about the criteria, not the actual decision itself, as I I read it. Um, and there may not be any. You say that there <laughs> there was no change. There may your response may be no documents in that regard. I, I don't know. And then four is the one that kind of gets to the nub of uh, uh, you know what documents were actually considered, um, or what what communications there were regarding. Uh, the decision to terminate, and, and that seems to me something very closely aligned with what would have to be producing the administrative record anyway, since so there's discussions, considerations, communications about terminating uh, the designations for these four countries. That's what's at issue here. So that's why I asked the question, actually, wouldn't this be in the administrative record anyway? Because if it is, what's the harm in, in getting that produced, whether by way of handing over the administrative record or doing an advanced portion of the administrative record. It seems like this is well within what would normally have to, you know, would be produced if there were an administrative record. I think it's certainly true for number one, uh, Your Honor, or interrogatory number one and RFP number one. Uh, four would be a little bit different because we're talking about, you know, communications with members of Congress, international bodies, non-governmental organizations. You know, I, I don't know that that is you know, typically the type of material that would be in the record, depending upon who it's coming from within the agencies. Well, let me ask. Let me ask the plaintiffs then. Um, correspondence with members of Congress. Uh, why is that? What's the relevance of that? Is. Uh, there are a number of members of Congress who uh, wrote advocating the extension of the TPS decisions that uh, then were resulted in terminations. The responses to those may uh, manifest a, a legal interpretation. Um, and then on the other side, there were uh, Congress people who uh, I think were supportive of the termination of TPS, and those communications also may manifest um, either as to the equal protection claim or as to the APA claim. The other one in there, Your Honor, uh, is about non-governmental organizations. The, uh, com the complaint, or I think it may, it may be something we discovered after and is in the res response to the motion to dismiss and not in the complaint, but um, there was communication from uh, anti-immigrant organizations. Uh, well, anti-immigrant organizations, the, the, I think it's the Center for Immigration Studies or um, perhaps it's FAIR, um, you know, they listed this, the, the need to uh, end TPS as one of their kind of priority uh, immigration uh, goals. So in other words, this may shed light on sort of the knowledge and state of mind and position of the agency. So it's not, and this could be post, post uh, decision. Could be, Your Honor. But the fact, a trier of fact would get to look at even a post decision Right. The, so the, there's where the difference is between the administrative record, which is generally pre-decisional as things considered, <clears throat> versus probative value of the state of mind after. And there, therein lies the difference, because if you're asserting an equal protection violation um, and invidious purpose, then post-decision statements can shed light as probative of what 
And Absolutely. That's why you have to go beyond, that's your argument, why you go beyond the administrative record. Absolutely, Your Honor. So the President's statements about Haiti and El Salvador may shed light on the motive on Sudan and Nicaragua, even though those decisions had already been made. And with respect to the 30B-6, you, you, your plan would be, once you get these documents and presumably the administrative record, you would be prepared to do a 30B-6 deposition on, on all these topics? Uh, you know, we haven't uh, spoken internally about uh, whether the topics are too disparate uh, and whether we would want uh, two witnesses for half a day instead of one for seven hours. Uh, that's the discussions we haven't had. But, but uh, yes, we, we would want to have a 30B-6 uh, deposition to uh, cover it. At least the two big buckets, you know, the, I, I don't think the due process claim for the children requires a lot of discovery, but the other two, the strands, the APA and the um, equal protection claim uh, do, potentially. All right. One other thing, Your Honor, um, when my friend says it's overbroad, there's a lot of documents, Your Honor had wanted us not to be <laughs> in this position today, you know, and, and, uh, and then we should have gotten their objection, and we should have had a meet and confer about uh, why we need to narrow the search terms. We repeatedly asked them. We said, tell us the search terms you're using, because we want to narrow them. And they weren't willing to uh, do that today. So I think I'm not sure they should be getting the benefit of um, saying that now when they had the opportunity to have a substantive discussion. And we could be arguing here about uh, why are, is your search pulling whatever it was, tens of thousands of documents for this testimony preparation. There must be a packet that was given to the secretary. These are the things that you should read in preparation of your testimony. Why are they doing search? All right, well, let, let, let me ask uh, counsel for the government. What, uh, first, is there any reason why you can't produce the administrative records since you've been working on it for some time now and you have a good fix at least of what you think the administrative record is and hope you will take into account? Um, uh, the court's comment about uh, uh, the breadth of the administrative record uh, expanding, uh, extending to those materials directly or indirectly considered by any agency decision makers, why they can't be produced, let's say, in 10 days. I know that we were able to do that for Sudan and Nicaragua. Uh, there are three or four days of technical work that has to be done that gets built into our production deadline. I know that we could do that for Sudan and Nicaragua, and then I would ask for Haiti and El Salvador to be able to produce two weeks after that. All right. Well, let me, uh, and with respect to, um, so you've not had a meet and confer with counsel with respect to uh, requests for productions one, four, six, and seven? We've had uh, two conversations about where we stood um, and the fact that we were producing documents. I, I think plaintiff's counsel thought we were going to be in a position to say, you know, here are the X number of documents and we can we give you objections to each one or something. I'm not quite sure what they thought we would be doing, but I, I want to emphasize how much work we have been doing in compiling these documents and that it, it is more laborious than I think plaintiffs believe, but it, that is the, 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 the case. Um, you know, if, if you know, the, the, the numbers I gave you just now are just for, uh, you know, just a handful of those documents and so, or a handful of those requests rather. Well, all right, so let, let, let's put it this way. Um, I'd like you to meet and confer right after this hearing to, to talk about um, uh, the specifics of uh, requests one, four, six, and seven, and for you to explain what it is you, the complications and the scope issues and the, contestant, and the search terms, that kind of stuff, to see whether there's something you all can agree to to work that out more quickly. Um, and I will say that my inclination is that, um, and, and I will get out a ruling quickly, if, if, if nothing more than a skeletal, skeletal uh, ruling, at, at least at first, so that you know where we're headed with respect to the motion to dismiss. Um, should this case or parts of this case survive, um, then I am inclined to uh, order um, uh, the production in responses to uh, one, four, six, and seven and for then also the parties to be confer about the possibility of a 30B6 deposition and to order that the uh, administrative records be produced uh, quickly because we are coming up upon an August 23rd uh, deadline for a filing of a brief, if we get to that point, uh, opening brief on a preliminary injunction motion and we don't have time to really delay that because then we're, uh, you know, the hearing is not until uh, September 
and we need to hear this matter before then, by then. So, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, take the matter under submission and then um, uh, uh, get out a ruling fairly quickly once I've reviewed some more of the cases that you all have cited. And then um, I would like you to meet and confer uh, on a provisional production, or at least provisionally, conditionally, uh, on uh, if this case were to proceed on the discovery matters that I just mentioned. And just to follow up on the deadlines for the administrative record, we're, we're going with 10 days from today for? Well, I would, I'll say this for now. I would say 10 days for Sudan and Nicaragua, and within a week after that uh, uh, for uh, El Salvador and, and Haiti. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.